Hello and welcome to the very first women's show on LFC Day Trippers. I'm your host, Chris Brack, and for our first show, I am joined today by the returning Emma Sanders. How are you doing, Emma? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, great to be on. Great to have a, a new women's football show as well. Really excited for this. Yeah, yeah, I've been, been, been in the pipeline for a little while there, so I've been quite excited to get this done. A bit earlier than the last show we did, to be fair. Yeah, definitely. That, that that was a late one. I think I was already about three bottles of rum in. No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just by some of your predictions, you might have been, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were well off, weren't they? Cool, cool. And then I'm also joined here by uh, Philippa Smallwood from the Anfield Rap and also part of the Liverpool Women's Supporters Club. How are you doing, Philippa? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, Chris. Glad it's Friday. <laughs> I know I know that feeling. I know that feeling very, very well. And I am also joined by uh, Neil Atkinson from the Anfield Rap as well. How are you doing, Neil? Very well indeed. I'm I'm really excited about the weekend. I think it's like it's it feels like huge, vivid football. I've just come out. I had COVID for a, for, for a period, so I had to sort of lock down for for a, for obviously for the ten days that everyone does. But it feels like this weekend is like offering these treats of a, a really exciting uh, game, uh, men's game on the on the Saturday evening, and then the idea of starting this new journey with Liverpool women on the Sunday. Honestly, it, it could not be better. Uh, I am absolutely uh, overjoyed. That the weekend is in store, bank holiday weekend as well. What more? What more can you ask for? What more can you ask for? So, um, we haven't really done a women's show properly on LSE Directly Trippers. So, you know, we're trying to introduce, get people know, but say people who follow me know I tend to talk about the women's team a lot, talk about the players a lot. So, I want to kind of give people a feel for like, you know, where the, where the team is, how we're getting on, what we've brought in, and where we sort of expect to be for the season. So, um, we are currently sat in the championship. Um, this is our second season now, and um, so you know it's got our aim. I'm sure this year is to get promotion. But Emma, what what got you in? What got you into like sort of like uh, LC win wins? You sort of sort of following them. Um, you know, being like a match goer. What, what sort of got you into them? Um, it's a good question. Actually, I don't really know what what necessarily got me into the women's team. Really, I guess. To me, football is football, always has been. It's the same thing. Yes, obviously, it's it's different styles of play from the, from the men's. But as it is at academy football, you know, you play different football is what you do to senior football. So I just love all forms of football, really. And as soon as I moved up here for, for university, obviously, I've got family from Manchester as well. So as soon as I moved up sort of towards the northwest, it was a case of just trying to get over to as much football as I possibly could. So... Um, that meant that meant the, the local men's team, it meant the academy and it meant, meant the women's all in one go. So um, what I really enjoyed, I think I said this on the show uh, to yourself last time, actually, with, with the women's um, from obviously a journalism point of view, um, as a as a young aspiring sports journalist at uni, um, the access that you could get um, in the women's game was just really exciting and the opportunities and experiences that you could get. So um, I kind of fell in love with the game more from a journalism point of view as opposed to being a fan initially um just because of like i say more the experiences and actually being able to attend sort of matches and be in press boxes and do one-on-one interviews and get to know a little bit more about the club as to maybe what you would have got as a fan and then because i enjoyed it so much i ended up kind of watching more games and following the women's team more and then once i got to know them that was when i kind of became more more and more of a fan so it was sort of a bit of a, a backhanded way through i'd say yeah, cool. I think my sort of background was I, I was aware of the team, so I, I knew they'd won the WSL twice. Uh, so uh, I think I remember watching BT Sports when they won the second one on the last game of the season. I was seeing, you know, the celebration in, in the in the crowd, thinking like it, that looks boss. That you know, yeah. Uh, and then uh, my daughter, my daughter arrived, and I just flashed my memory. It's actually five years ago today. My daughter would, my daughter and I went to our first game because she turned three, just started playing football. So I thought I'll take it to the. I'll take it to Liverpool because around the corner for me, so she can see what it's like watching other women play football. And that was it. We hooked, you know. The atmosphere was really good, you know. As I, you know, I'm pretty similar. As long as it's football, I I watch it, especially if it's got a Liverpool badge in it. But the big yeah. thing that drew me, and especially with having a young daughter, was how accessible the players are. Which you don't. It's hard to do that in the men's game when you got. Um, so it was quite. I it was, I quite like that sort of personal touch. That you know, win, lose, or draw after the game. You can always meet the players after the game, have a, t- have a five minute chat. If you get to picture with them, get to self with them. And I quite like that personal touch. You, you tend to get more of an attachment, I think, to the team and how they are. So that's kind of what, what I sort of grew into. I mean, now, you know, I, I go all 
I go to try and go to nearly every home game. I try and get the odd away in if, if I can. And it just becomes part of my, my routine. Plus, it's very hard to get a ticket for the men's game as well. So it's another way of watching international level football, you know, but you can get yourself into. Neil, what's your what's your sort of point? Just sort of going back to doing the job um, in 2013 and being aware that there's a, there's, a, there's a women's side, a Liverpool side that's being very successful and wanting to, to pay attention to them and then going and really enjoying it, to be honest. And But all, all, all the little bits and pieces from there, like recognising... I always have a story that there was a group of um, young girls to the right of me at a game once. They were all, I'd say, between 11 and 12. They were all on the same, the same team. And one of the things that they they were absolutely enthralled by what they were watching. And one of the things they were saying to one another was, you know, you can hear the players talking, you can see when they're pointing. And they were having this conversation. And this conversation, one of the things that sort of hit me with it is as as, as a human who's been very skeptical around the idea of sport and role models, I was I was sort of nudged out of a form of complacency, which is that if you if you grow up as a boy and and, and into being a young man. You're not short of sport and role models, and what that actually means is that you get to you get to say it doesn't matter because you get to say, well, it's no big deal. You know what I mean? It's this is just this, it's just it's just the nature of this and the nature of that. Whereas that in in reality, what what I saw before my very eyes was a group of a group of young young women, well, girls, be enthralled with what they could see these other women doing because they don't get to see it. Literally, doesn't happen anywhere, and. From there, it was something that sort of grabbed me as well. There's, there's got to be different ways to sort of to to tell these stories and and, and put this these bits and pieces about in a in a professional sense and then in a personal sense, just literally enjoying watching games of football. I think that we can we can over egg certain puddings in amongst all of this and and you know I I I completely understand, for instance, your point, Chris, around around access for for players, for people, for for young people. But for me, first and foremost, I think it has to it has to live and die on the fact that the really good games of football played that played at a good level and in a good tempo, um, you know, and that is what you then sort of got to see and got to see more and more of the more and more that you went and you know that sort of ebbed and flowed in lots of different ways. There is there's clear sort of questions around time um, that I understand for people, but ultimately for me, this is this is about watching, getting to watch very very good footballers play the game really really well and everything else just becomes an added bonus and that's what i want and that's what i think it should be um within that as i say the ad, one of the added bonuses is that we just simply don't have elite enough elite women's sports that sort of grabs public attention i think that that is you know that's really important as far as i'm concerned and that's something that i think does matter you know but first and foremost we have to enjoy these games as and when they come and I, I certainly feel as though I do. It was a real highlight for me last season, being fortunate enough to be in the ground to watch Liverpool women when other people were locked down um, and when it was obviously very, very difficult to attend. And then times before then as well, getting to watch, for instance, footballers like Jill Scott and understand how she is immediately, obviously, very, very brilliant indeed. But this season and part of all of this is, you know, for me, it lives and dies on winning and playing well and the games being excellent games. And that's my expectation around this moving into this season. And then from there, the idea of being able to have a women's team at Liverpool that we can all genuinely be proud of uh, and get right behind. And I think that that's very, very available for us. And I think it sort of starts Sunday. Excellent. Excellent. Philip, what's your, how did your Liverpool journey start? Um, I mean, I, I started watching probably when I was in my 20s. Um, and back then it was literally, they were playing in a field pretty much. Um, and then a kind of, it's like Neil was just saying there, you know, at the time you, you go in watching men's games, you, you know, you've got a life basically. Um, so I ended up not watching them for quite a number of years. And then when they did the spring series a few years ago, um, I ended up really getting back into it again. Um, and me and Neil basically made this little bit of a pact where we would really invest in the women's game and we would go and watch Everton uh, women play as well as Liverpool women. Um, and it ended up being our little thing that we would do. Um, and then obviously COVID happened and you end up not being able to go to the games. Um, as with Neil, I was quite fortunate last season that I was able to go and watch the women quite a bit. Um, and I think the thing that, that really keeps me invested in it is the fact that it's just such a physical game. And I think I, as, a, as a fellow woman, I can appreciate uh, 
the physicality, uh, the energy, the the pace in the game, um, which I think, you know, far too often we compare men's and women's elite sport. Um, and it for me, it shouldn't be like that. It should literally be, you know, recognised for its for its own standout moments. Um, and, you know, I, f I feel like, you know, the women's game needs and is probably going to get a lot more exposure now with the new TV deal and everything. And I think, you know, that's only going to make the women's game more accessible and a lot more um, appreciated, I think, by people um, like ourselves, you know, who, who do appreciate the game as it is. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just like Neil, I'm really, really excited for this season. I think it's, it's going to be a really good one. Um, and I can't wait to see the women on Sunday. Yeah, I'm, what's the, I'm the same. Um, I got on a bigger appreciation now for how uh, watching the game uh, than I did. It was my little routine. Uh, me and my daughter, that was our routine is we go and watch the women's games. We both enjoy it, you know, enjoys it. And Olivia used to always say, it's like seeing my mates. That's how she, she views it. My concern has been over sort of lockdown is children, probably like my daughter, uh, she won't watch football on the telly. She's got no interest in it. But if she's in a ground watching it, she's absolutely transfixed. Oh, because she plays as a defender, so she sits and watches defenders. She very re she actually misses probably half the goals in the game because she wants to watch <laughs> defenders. Because in her head, that's where I play, so I want to watch what they do, and yeah. it's great. It's watching because I watch her sometimes. I miss part of the game because she's transfixed. So I'm looking forward to that because she's um really keen to see all that side of it. So, Philip, from your point of view, uh, following Liverpool, what's been your favourite game and what's been your favourite moment? Um. My favourite games probably actually from last season. You know, me and Neil were luckily lucky enough to be in the ground to see um, us play against Man United in in the League Cup, um, and it was just it was really good to see because obviously you know we'd been relegated, uh, we were playing in the league below, and you know United were coming and we pretty much was like if we don't get hammered here, this is going to be a really good result. You know, just don't let the confidence get dinted. And um, we ended up winning three three one, and that for me, you know, is my favourite favourite game of going watching the women. You know, since I've been going, you know, the, there hasn't been that many highlights. You know, we we were struggling for a couple of years, I would say, in the WSL, mm. um, and it's difficult, I think, to to take positives out of games when you you struggle in week in week out. Um, so that one for me, and I would probably say that um, Rachel Furness's goal in that one. Um, you know, the, the corner, just, I mean, it's just, it's everything it's about Rachel Furness, you know, just getting there in the box and, and getting ahead on, on the end of a, a great ball. Um, you know, and yeah. I think uh, we ju jumped up out of our seats, didn't we, Neil? So, uh, yeah. no, no, this was, this was, no, this was, this, this, uh, sort of to an extent, Philip has stolen my answer in that that was, that was hugely <laughs> enjoyable last season. And that was, no, it was, it was hard to, it was, it was really weird in that. I felt a little bit like we were almost an incursionary force from the point of view of being able to support because you shouldn't yeah. have been behaving quite as we were as that game wears <laughs> on. It's fair to say, um, it wasn't necessarily the best conduct you've ever seen in, within a press box in your life. And, and I did feel vaguely judged, uh, after the fact, uh, I think also there was, there was a period of time where Phil Neville was stalking around the gaff as well. If I remember rightly, Philip, yeah, um, <laughs> and, and there was a couple of comments that were made there as well, because we were, you know, it's this odd sort of thing where you're in the media part, but you're also right next to the director's box and everybody can hear anything, everything because there's only 30 of you in the ground. And it was fair to say that by the time when Furnace makes it three, one, it is, it, it's, it was, it was an undignified display. <laughs> but one which I'd like to think would resonate uh, to Liverpool supporters in general, but also especially to those women on that pitch at that time, and that they had no one else to do this to. Uh, you know what I mean? There was no one else. There was no other noise coming from anywhere else. <laughs> but there was six of us in the press box going absolutely berserk. Uh, and some might say classlessly, but you know they, 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 those, those people can forget about it. We had a great time. <laughs> What's yours, Emma? Yeah, I feel like I've, I've I've been left out here because uh, yeah, that was the I think that was the one home. You were working, yeah, you went there. Yeah, you went I can make there. Like, <laughs> yeah, so I I made the Man City one where Phil Neville was there and and all of his England players ended up having a good game and uh, put it this way, Liverpool did not win three one and uh, <laughs> in the press box. So uh, yeah, I missed out on that, but um, 
Yeah, no, that, I thought that was a really tough question. And actually, uh, speaking of Fernie, like most of my favourite memories probably revolve around Fernie. I think I've made it quite open that she's my favourite player. Uh, I don't think I'm allowed to say that as a journalist, but we're going to go with it. Um, <laughs> no one's watching, so, be honest. Yeah, I, I, I've written down here um, the game where we were actually 2 all with Arsenal in the Cup. So this is back in early 2020. We end, uh, Sorry, not in the Cup, it was in the league. We went to their place and I was flying out. Um, I can't remember. I was flying out somewhere from London shortly afterwards. We ended up losing 3-2. But um, Fernie scored and assisted and Rinzola scored the other one for us. I was at that game, yeah. Yeah, and it was an absolute, especially Fernie's one, it was like on the half volley. It was an absolute screamer of a goal. And Rinz's goal as well was brilliant. It was like basically she raced through one-on-one -on -one and it was just, yeah. Oh, okay. so yeah. All I can remember from that game was I, I stupidly got all the way to the ground and remember I left my coat at home. Oh, luckily, yeah. luckily <laughs> someone let me a hoodie. It was so cold. Yeah, I, was yeah. sat there at, I was literally sat there in jeans, T-shirt and somebody's hoodie. I was, <laughs> cold. I was so oh, cold. Oh, nightmare. Yeah, well, I don't envy you for that. But yeah, that, that was uh, that was pretty good. Even though, um, like, you know, when we went into half time and it was 2 all, and you thought, but yeah, like, we might win this and then... I think it was Jordan Nobbs ended up scoring a late winner, mm. which was a bit of a blow. But up until that point, just because <coughs> we were right in a relegation battle then, just to be able to sort of, you know, dent Arsenal for for 60 minutes and score those two goals at their place was pretty good. But um, yeah. 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 yeah, I think from a personal point of view as well, I remember it's slightly not to do with the actual football, but I remember um, interviewing um, Shanice van der Sanden when she was at Liverpool. Oh, yeah. um, in the mix zone ahead of a, a player a, a player awards ceremony um, and this was at Anfield actually so she was on the red carpet bit and then um, I tried to ask her who she thought was going to be the Liverpool women's player of the season and she thought I'd asked her um, do you think you should be the player of the season to which she <laughs> rightfully turned around and said yes I do believe I can win it and then walked away <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah that was that's probably right up there to be honest <laughs> Oh, brilliant. The one that always sticks in my mind was, I think it's in the Scott Rogers era, uh, we beat Man City at Chester 1-0. And this is when City, City battered most teams in that period and we took an early lead. And then after that, it was just a proper all backs to the wall. We're keeping this 1-0 and we're going for it. And it was, it, I've, it's probably, I've never been so tense. You know, I was shaking. I was couldn't, couldn't control myself. The uproar when we when the full time whistle went was unbelievable. I think it was on BT as well. So that also helped that you know we got fans to see it. Uh, my two favourite moments for different reasons. One is Neil like this. Um, Neil Charles uh, scoring the win in the derby on BT yeah. Sport, and the reason it's a it was a great moment. I remember seeing Neil Charles' mum run past to celebrate with her. It was really great. And then I flick BT Sports because I'd recorded it, and all I could see is my daughter's face right bang in the middle, absolutely ah. overjoyed <laughs> that Liverpool are winning. Uh, and the new one, it's it is a happy memory. It was um, two years ago when we beat Millwall in the cup, um, winning comfortably, and the and um, Ash Hodgson comes on uh, first game back after coming from coming back from an ACL. And I, we, you speak to Ash after the game; she's a really nice person. You know, it's a horrible injury to come back from. And within two minutes coming on, she bends at top corner. That was the most emotional moment I think I've had in football. Because you get to know players and get to talk to them. And it was really, really like, that's what you wanted to see. So that's probably my moment, I would say. More of a touching moment. But I, I, it always sticks in my head that when you think about it, you know, that's what you want. That's what you want to see. You know, a good player, nice person, come back from something like that and kick, just kick on. And obviously, just kicked on it ever since, really. I mean, she's... Too short now of being the record appearance holder, I believe, for Liverpool. So, you know, and she's still got plenty of years left for Liverpool. So, you know, I'm looking forward to that. So, on to this season. So, it's been a bit of it's been a bit of a summer of change for Liverpool. And uh, we now have uh, a new old manager in uh, Matt Beard. And we'll, we'll come <laughs> back to him. We'll come back to him uh, shortly. But in terms of ins and outs, you know, it's been quite busy for Liverpool. We've had uh, six players leave and we've had um, eight players uh, come in. So, in terms of Players that left Emma, I mean, from my point of view, I would probably say three of them were quite, from my a fan's point of view, were quite surprising. In Kirsten Lynette, Becky Jane and Amy Rogers, I was quite surprised. I thought they might have been players that might have stuck, stuck around to be part of the squad or part of the new Liverpool for this season. They were probably the three that surprised me. I probably thought the other three that left made sense for different reasons. Rinsola, to be fair, I think wanted to leave in January to Brighton 
uh, the move didn't happen. We never really saw Rinsola second half of the season, so he always kind of felt like maybe that was a move that was lined up for the summer. Uh, Jess Clark, uh, I think it was uh, correct if I'm wrong, was it end of a contract? Um, really good servant for Liverpool. You know, went played really well. She just unfortunately suffered with a lot of knee injuries, and it was really un- unfair on her. And then probably the most selfless person, which was um, Sophie Bradley Auckland, who pretty much put a career on hold last year to stay in Nottingham and look after the people in her care home and put a career on hold, you know, and she's uh, had her second child now and decided she wants to move to a club that's close to home, not commute from Nottingham every day, which to be fair, I, that, I can totally understand that. And, you know, we, I wish Sophie all, all the best, all, all the best. Cause I mean, you know, it's a very selfless thing. So pretty much put your career on hold, which, you know, it's very, yeah, it's a very selfless thing to do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like I, I agree with you. Actually, Sophie's contract had actually ended months before the summer, but the club just mm. hadn't actually announced it. So, oh, nice. um, so that, yeah, that one obviously what was expected um, from from my point of view. But yeah, so that so that was just made official, like you say, Jess Clark as well. Uh, wish her all the best. I think she deserves mm. to try and go out and get some game time. Um, <coughs> yeah, I was. Uh, I wasn't too surprised about Kirsten in it. I think, I think she she would definitely wanted to stay. I would have liked to have seen her stay. Mm. Um, but I also think um, with the with the attacking players that that Mad Beard wanted to bring in, it was inevitable that that one was gonna one was gonna have to go. And I think out of out of the options, um, Kirsty probably would have been the one that wasn't playing as regularly, wasn't featuring as regularly as as perhaps the likes of, of some of the other attacking players. So. Um, obviously, with Emily Festrop leaving as well, um, yeah. Again, she 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 came to the end of her contract, and as far as I understand, Liverpool didn't offer her another one. So um, that was kind of the two strikers leaving, which I can't. Which and obviously Kirsty can play um, across the midfield as well, but yeah. kind of those two attacking players leaving, which made way for for the likes of um, uh, yeah, obviously the, the players that we brought in. So um so that kind of made sense um i was really surprised about amy rogers um mm. really surprised um i know that there were talks about her extending um while well, signing a new deal um and then obviously that that sort of happened before matt Beard came in and then um unfortunately she wasn't in matt's plans which yeah i was really surprised about i think she's going to be a great signing for london city lionesses and i just hope that one doesn't come back to <laughs> to bite us really um yeah becky jane again it, uh, that's I think that's kind of in that that category with Kirsty Lynette really where um I I wanted her to stay but again um I don't think I was too um too gutted really because I think the you know the players that we that we brought in on paper in terms of defensive cover um kind of makes sense really um but yeah obviously with with Meg Campbell's injury record it's um yeah you just got to hope that in the long run she can um she can get a lot of appearances in for Liverpool because Becky Jane, that was one thing you can say was that she was consistent and she was, mm-hmm. you know, she had the ability to play in several positions. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to be hard to replace. But again, I think she she wanted to make sure she had regular game time. And if if she wasn't going to be in Matt Beer's plans, then, you know, she's still got, you know, like some good, some good solid years ahead of her. So she, even though she is kind of in that older age, age bracket, she's still, she's still quite fit. And like I say, she's, she does pretty well on the injury front. So, um, yeah, I think as soon as she kind of knew she wasn't really in, in the plans, then it was a good decision for her personally to, to to move on elsewhere and find game time. But, yeah, looking forward to seeing what the what the new signings can do, really. Yeah, so, Philippa, think of the new signings then. So, we've got eight new players. Um, so, I, I, I'm pretty upfront and you know this, Philippa, is that when we sign players, within two minutes of signing the play, your Twitter goes off of me DM and you're going, tell me all about this player because you know, <laughs> I it's not quite like the men's game where if we if we if we're linked to some kid that you've never heard of, there's 15 YouTube highlights of him within two minutes and you you know your opinions formed in a sort of way. I I like this part of the women's game that is um, what I see of a player is what I see on the pitch. I have yeah. no one else to influence me in terms of how how they play what they are. They are it's what I see. I quite like I, I like that part of it. So I mean, we've got two of the former Ed returning in uh, Jazz Matthews, who uh, a fantastic uh, centre back, and then we've got Yana Daniels, who could play anywhere along the, the front front line, and it's probably more direct probably than some of the players we've had in the past, which you know I think gives us a different element. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, th I think I found her a little bit inconsistent when she was with us the first time, I would say. Um, mm. But I think, you know, she went back to Bristol um, and she played really well for Bristol. Obviously, she's worked with Matt as well before um, when he was at Bristol last season. So um, I think, you know, he, he knows the player that he's getting and he knows what, he, you know, the job that he wants her to do and what she can bring to the team. Um, and then Yaz Matthews, who I think did really well with us the first time round, a really solid defender. Um, you know, and it gives us that that replacement for Sophie, I would say. Mm. Um, you know, it gives us that extra body at the back as well, because it was it was a position where I felt maybe we, we were a little bit lacking in numbers last season. Um, and yeah, a really good compliment, I would say, to, to Nifahi um, and... Uh, Michaela Moore, who I thought, you know, did really, really well towards the back end of last season as well. Um, so she's going to be into her second season. So I think, I think hopefully we'll see see a lot more of Michaela this season and and mm. see, you know, exactly what she can bring as well. Um, and obviously the fans won't have seen seen Michaela yet, so uh, that that should be pretty exciting as well. Yeah, she did well, Michaela. She has to be patient because. Um... Uh, at the start of the season, you couldn't displace uh, Liam Robe and Fahi. That was that was the that was the partnership yeah. for quite some time. Uh, I mean, the benefit of of Leanne is she can play centre back, left back, right back, and is equally good at all all three positions. So, again, like you said, it just gives us that bit more flexibility, a bit of depth, so we can we we can actually rotate or you know cope with you know yeah you know, seen injuries. Uh, and then you know the one thing I, th I thought was a smart sign was uh, Megan Campbell who. Uh, left back from Man City has the longest throw I think I've ever seen. I've never seen anyone throw it, throw it like she can. But also, it gives someone to, as a, a bit of conversation for Tyler Hines, Neil, who I thought was brilliant last season, but probably tied near the end of the season. But to be fair, we we only had really probably one senior left back last season, which probably told her a little bit. Uh, no, I think that's absolutely fair. I think that one of the things that you've got to find a way. I mean, Leanne Robe could play out there as well. She starts the season mm. playing at centre half, but she can play right the way across the back line. Left back could possibly be a least comfortable position, but you get the impression she can at least possibly do the Continental Cup games there if need be. Meg Campbell, Emma said before, her injury record is a little bit of a question mark around her, and that's why she's probably playing for Liverpool, to be quite honest with you, uh, in this season, and why there isn't a WSL side, that's that's absolutely desperate for her. But if Liverpool can get Meg onto the pitch here and there, then she, you know, the throwing you've mentioned, but also she's just a good player. Mm -hmm. I thought Taylor was great first two-thirds of the season, so being able to keep her at her peak over the course of the campaign will matter, and the versatility of these defenders will be a big thing. Uh, I think it's worth saying, you know, right the way across the board that I've mentioned, Leanne. Neve can also move into mi into the sort of anchor in midfield if that's what Liverpool wants. Uh, Michaela Moore's got the same sort of quality if that's what Liverpool wants. Uh, you know, so there's, there's flexibility within there. And that's, for me, that's the thing that marks the squad out is there's firstly a lot of footballers who've shown that they've got a level in the WSL, not necessarily a top six level in the WSL, but they've at least featured a WSL level. But the other thing about them is there's a number of footballers who are meant or have cited themselves as being comfortable across a lot of positions. So, for instance, Rhiannon Roberts, you know, we've not talked about her yet. She supposedly sees herself or wants to be a right back first and foremost. Uh, now, Charlotte Wardlaw's in there as well. Uh, it does make me think that there's, you know, this Liverpool squad, I think, is it's big enough but it's tight, you know, it's not, It's you know, we're not, we're not talking here quite about two players for absolutely every position, but what there is, I think, is a lot of crossover of players being able to move around positions right the way through the squad. And I think that's something that the the, the manager will have obviously looked for. Uh, I'm wanting to get the best possible sort of football as he can get in for his budget. So the idea of there being that flexibility in there, I think, is valuable. It will matter. But, you know, ultimately... If Taylor Hines puts in the performances that we wanted to put in, the aim is not the idea of someone playing in Taylor's place. The aim is making sure that Taylor, if we needed to be absolutely tip-top with four league games of the season left because Liverpool are in a running where they need to get four wins to ensure that they get promoted, we needed to be able to be at that level and not tailing off. And I think that's the case across the board for this squad. You know, that is the con both concern to a slight extent, but also in general, it's what it needs to be about. You know, Leicester last season go up. They play 20 games, they win 16 of them. That's the standard. If you want to go up, you need to look at, you know, this season it'll be 22 games, but you've got to look at 22 games and be able to imagine a pathway where you're winning 17 or 18 of them. And if another side comes with you and the pressure's on at the end of the season, you need your players in the best possible shape. 
definitely agree. Definitely agree. So, Emma, in terms of the other signings, we've got um, Carla Humphrey, who also came from uh, Bristol. Um, I'll, can you tell us a bit more about what you know? What type of player is she? I know she's a central midfielder, but what sort of sort of style of player is she? Yeah, she's uh, she she came through the the Ars- I think it's the Arsenal youth youth team youth team set up there. She was highly rated there. I know Matt Beard has always put her in high regard. He was a big fan of her when when he was uh, he had that short stint at Bristol City. So um, she's she's meant to be very technical, um, very gifted on the ball. Um, so I think that's that's what Matt will be looking from her is to try and try and get the ball to her feet and get her to sort of be that playmaker in midfield. Um, obviously, alongside um, Kerry Holland and, and probably Bo Kearns, who you would expect to be to be in there. Um, but yeah, I think I think we we'd like to see her sort of linking up with with Rachel Furness, who who's obviously got the number ten shirt this season. But we have seen her play uh, very occasionally as as a number nine. So I I would expect to see that combination sort of between Carla Humphrey and, and Rachel Furness quite quite often this season. But yeah, like I say, she's really technical, good on the ball. She's got a good passing range. So. Um, I think she 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 could be that that sort of key link in in midfield. Yeah, which, which is good. I mean, what's quite good about the play, players of San is um, we've had quite a lot of ex, you know experienced players, but then we we have started to add a bit of youth to the side as well with uh, mm-hmm. Leanne Kern from West Ham, and we've got Rian Dean f- uh, from Tottenham. Uh, both in their both in their early twenties, both young forwards. Um, I think um, Rian was playing quite a bit, was getting some WSL minutes for Tottenham, wasn't she? Yeah, I think towards towards the end she was struggling a little bit for game time. I think that was why she was quite keen for a move away. Um, I know, sort of speaking from uh, people kind of within her camp, I think she was kind of quite keen to yeah to get sort of more game time. I know she was she was on the radar in the market in January, not necessarily for Liverpool, but just sort of seeing what opportunities would, would arise. So um, obviously, when Liverpool came in the summer, she was really 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 keen to, to join the club. So she'll be um yeah, she'll be keen to try and to try and put down a marker, I think, quite early on uh, and push for a starting place. Um I think the question mark over her has been I, I don't think anyone's denying her talents. I think I remember she scored a screamer at, at the um, the London Stadium against West Ham while playing for while playing for Spurs. So she's she's got talent. I think it was to, um sort of a lack of goals but Again, like I say, I think that comes with with a lack of consistency, kind of in the starting lineup. So hopefully, if she gets a few games on her about, then we can see a see a fire in. But um, yeah, Leanne Kane, and she was she was one who's you know she has she has scored goals. She has got quite a nice goal scoring record. So um, I think she's come in kind of primarily to do that, and hopefully that will take the pressure a little bit off off Dean, who can like you say she can hopefully show what what she's capable of doing, and and the goals will follow. Yeah, because if we're honest, Philip, probably the last couple of years that probably has been a bit of a struggle for Liverpool. Is we we just we haven't really had enough goals on the side. It, it, it's always been we need to get one nil and we need to hold it. It's yeah. You know, I'll probably say the last time we we were probably like consistently with a goal scorer was probably when we had uh, Beth England on loan. But I mean, you're talking yeah. two three years since since that since that happened. You know, we probably thought Rinsola was going to be that player, but you know, sadly that hasn't that hasn't worked out for, worked out for us. Yeah, I think um, it's definitely been an issue, um, just having a consistent goal scorer. Um, <laughs> you felt like we've had plenty of players who can maybe get four or five goals in a season, but can't necessarily get 10, 12, 15 goals. And, you know, you hope that, you know, the the players that we have brought in will be able to bring that, you know, if just one or two of them can get 10 or more, and then, you know, the rest can, can maybe add, you know, four or five themselves, then, then that's, that will really help us. Um, like you say, last season, you know, for me, we really, really struggled. When we when we scored one, we struggled to then make it into two, and that then left us with our nerves being jangled towards the end of games. And quite often, we ended up winning draw, uh, ended up drawing. Sorry. So, um, you know, it's something that that hopefully has been addressed in in this transfer window. And you know, you never know how signings are going to work out, but you know, I. I feel like they've been positive signings and, you know, they've, they've been addressing the areas that, that we've really struggled in. And um, I think it's added a lot of depth to the squad as well, because I think, you know, we had we had a few players that although we had the numbers there, they were often missing. And, you know, hopefully this season, you know, if we can keep the players fit, we'll, we'll have a lot more options there to be able to change things if things aren't working as well. Cool, cool. And then last two signings are we've got a uh, Katie Startrup from Brighton, who's a goalkeeper. So we now actually have 
a choice of three goalkeepers, which it can't it can't hurt to have that level of competition because you know right because uh, Laws and uh, Riley Foster have done really well for us. But you know it does help probably having a third senior goalkeeper uh, on just in case and also to keep them on the toes. And then the final one is Charlotte. Charlotte Wardlow, which I don't know too much about, but I know she's a young right back from Chelsea. Interesting though, as soon as you signed her, she was given the number two shirt, which is a bit of an indicator to me that she's getting games. She must be getting quite a bit of game time. And I suppose if Chelsea are alone in the two was, they must be expecting a bit of game time as well. What do you think, Neil? I think uh, yeah, that, I mean, and also she starts the last preseason friendly, uh, Charlotte as well, which makes me think that there is a plan there that Liverpool do expect to use be using her on a pretty regular basis. I wouldn't have thought. You know, she can sit on Chelsea's bench or be in Chelsea's uh, developmental uh, setup. I think she's definitely earmarked to get a number of games for Liverpool. You mentioned Katie as well within there. You know, I think Rachel and Riley, that's the area where last season to me, Liverpool looked the best stocked, uh, frankly, mm. and looked as though they were genuinely both uh, WSL level week in, week out in terms of performance and outcome. I thought that both really, really impressed uh, on a regular basis. So Katie coming in, I think, is there to, to support them. There's the idea, I think, with Riley especially, there'll be specific international call-ups that they might have to pay attention to. Uh, they may well have fancied the third one. I think Charlotte is will be expecting to to get a number of games. Um, now, it's a funny thing with the with the way in which the women's fixture list works, and it is one to sort of flag for people who are, who are coming to it for the first time, that the games tend to come in patches, so the games aren't quite as consistent as I think any of us on this show would like. You know, I, I'd like that to to be, you know, for instance, they only play 22 league games. I'd love them to be playing much close to 30. Uh, frankly, there's the there's the Conti Cup stuff as well within there. Uh, so that does add some games, but they are a group system within a league cup sort of set up. But then there's the FA Cup in the second half of the season. My point is, there's a lot of strange sort of two-week fallow periods in the women's game here and there uh, that can drive you a bit mad and go from there but ultimately i think there is something around this where you want to get the you want to be able to ensure that you can play at a certain level for four for four games in two weeks but then you might not play again for two weeks so i would expect uh, charlotte wardlaw to be getting a ton of games and the stuff in there for the goalkeepers as well as well especially if certain knocks are getting picked up here and there uh worth bearing in mind that there may be something around that in general, for me, you know, the core thing, if you actually look at last season's league table in the most basic sense, you mentioned there before, for me, you look at Rihanna Dean's numbers when she was a Tottenham Hotspur, that's exactly what Liverpool are trying to bring in. Uh, she scores 14 in 19, uh, playing for Tottenham uh, three or four seasons back in the Championship. And if you just simply look at last season's league table, Liverpool are as parsimonious as Leicester, uh, whilst winning four fewer games, uh, but Leicester scored about 16 more goals uh, over the course of the season. And that that is the defining thing for this Liverpool side. Watching them last season at times, it was frustrating. You'd see them get ahead in games, but you wouldn't see them kill a game off. It was very, very rare you'd see them kill a game off and take a game away from an opposition team. And I think that that's got to be the thing that's worked on in both penalty areas, but I think especially in the attacking penalty area. I think from Liverpool's point of view, scoring some goals in every single sense. You know, We want more people to be watching this team this season, more people at the matches. To do that, they want to see a winning side, they want to see an aggressive side, they want to see an attacking side. So I think that that's genuinely the case, but also the idea of how over the course of the season, what do Liverpool need to change? It's changing draws into wins and it's changing defeats into draws. And if they do that well enough, and the best way to do that is sticking the ball in the back of the net, they'll find the whole season so much more straightforward. So if Liverpool can move themselves from scoring sort of 36, 38 league goals into scoring 52 to 56 league goals, then you'll just see a world of difference. And games that were sticky last season become sticky because Liverpool offer opponents hope at nil-nil, at one-nil even. You know, they're not turning one-nil into two-nil. All the things you need to do within football matches to make sides either themselves wilt or give yourself the confidence then to turn two-nil into three-nil. But getting that goal that turns one-nil into two-nil is really important. And hopefully with Kernan and with Dean and with Daniels, Liverpool have got that firepower. And if, you know, for instance, the third or fourth most likely scorer in any Liverpool eleven is Rachel Furness, then that's a much healthier place to be in than last season, where the likeliest scorer a lot of the time when Liverpool took to the pitch was Rachel Furness. So I think it's something that genuinely that is that is the thing to focus on, and that's the thing to hopefully see from game one on Sunday is how this Liverpool side, as and when it gets ahead, what it does next, and how it takes the game away from opponents. Oh, absolutely, I can't can't really add any more to that, Neil. To be fair, so. The other obviously big addition to the to the side is we've got uh, a new manager, 
uh, Matt Beard. So for people who haven't followed Liverpool before, um, Matt Beard was the Liverpool manager um, when we won the titles in 2013-2014. He's a very experienced manager, uh, left Liverpool for Boston Breakers uh, in America and then came back uh, to West Ham, got West Ham to the first ever FA Cup final. Uh, and then he was interim manager at uh, Brist- uh, Bristol City. So he's a very experienced manager. He's probably fairly sought after, I probably think, for quite a few WSL clubs. So I would think um, um, for him to come back to Liverpool, he's def- he obviously has been been made certain assurances about the club for him to come for a, him a to come back and b to you know drop down to championship level. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it it helped that he's. He'd already proven himself to Liverpool. You know, a lot of people within the club knew knew him. They knew what his style was. They knew that he could deliver success. Like you say, he won back-to-back uh, league titles with Liverpool in his last stint. So they know what he's all about. And then, he's, you know, he's gone and added to those experiences. He's kind of done it at different stages in the WSL table. You know, he's done it right at the bottom with, with Bristol. He sort of had that that relegation battle with them. Yes, they, they, they went down, but he was... Um, they were they were long gone before he came in and he put them in a position where they were still in with a chance of staying up on the final day. Um, West Ham, you could say, were you know a, a mid-table team. He took them to an FA Cup final and then obviously he's, he's won the league with Liverpool. So he's kind of done it at all ends of the table in terms of the top flight. So I think he's got a different range of experience. Um, but yeah, certainly when, when, he, when he went for the job, I know that there was... There was competition from, you know, other other managers who, you know, a couple of strong contenders in there. So um, the club have obviously gone with Matt because, you know, they, they like what they see and they know what he's about. But you can see already that they've they've done their part. He's brought in members of staff that he wants to be part of the team. There's been changes um, up above. There's going to be a new managerial director, which I think is really, really exciting news for the club. Mm um that's that's only going to help Matt it means he can just focus on you know literally the things on the pitch now I think it's been widely reported that that was not what Vicky Jepson was able to do she was she was having to do four or five six roles when when she was a manager so hopefully you know that that new appointment will mean that Matt can focus purely on on the stuff on the pitch and like I say he's been allowed to bring in the staff around him um, to enable him um, to kind of get the results and deliver the messages that he wants to deliver. So, um, yeah, I think I think the club have done their part. But they've they've allowed in the players that he wanted to bring in as well. So, um, I don't think there can really be too many excuses now going into the season. I think Matt has what he needs. Um, certainly, as a base level, um, obviously there's there's quite clearly ways in which Liverpool can can improve. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think. In order for the rest to follow, um, he has to deliver them results so that he can prove that they're worth backing, essentially. Um, and I think, um, yeah, like I said, I think he's got everything in place to do that. So hopefully when the when the results come and the success comes, then, um, yeah, then, then the rest will follow as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the other good thing is, um, unlike previous seasons we have with Liverpool, and we've also managed to tie down a lot of our key players or kept or kept hold of them you know we've had uh, Raz Roberts as, as extended so as Ash Hodgson so those sort of things are also big positives is it's not the big turmoil that we've had probably to be fair when Vicky Jepson took over it was a very big turn I think it was pretty much 14 players walked out and the new manager left after one game and that's what Vicky stepped into you know which is that's a hell of a job to, to have to step into and I think she did fantastically well, you know, in very difficult circumstances. I'm pleased that she's back in football now. She's back here at Tottenham now, and she uh, first team coach at Tottenham. Is that correct? Assistant manager, yeah. Assistant manager, sorry. I knew I'd get that, I knew I'd get that title wrong. <laughs> so, so yeah, so Neil, you excited, excited with uh, Matt Beard joining? Yeah, absolutely. But I think it was it was the idea that there, was, there just needed to be uh, any solution, uh, frankly. Um, you know, it was a long time there where we were waiting for someone to come in. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that Matt's in. I think that you're able to look at Matt, and I think one of the key things is this idea that Matt himself wouldn't be doing this if he didn't feel as though he was going to be a WSL manager pretty soon. I think that the main thing that Liverpool have got to do, which they failed to do last season, and you know, there can be a number of inquiries as to why, is they've got to carry themselves like a WSL side in waiting on the pitch, off the pitch, and everything that they do, they've got to carry themselves like this is this is now a nine-month thing where we are waiting to become a WSL team again. 
And I think that if they do that and they nail that early within the campaign, I think one of the things you'll see, this is why, as I say, the goals matter. You, you'll you see sides, I think, roll over a lot quicker. What happened last season, game both from game to game and in games, Liverpool gave their opponents a lot of hope. They gave them a lot of encouragement and they didn't. They never quite nailed this idea that you are playing the mighty Liverpool. I think that what Matt offers is this idea that Liverpool can get back to where they were a few years back and that Matt himself will have that expectation. You go through the list of players, some of those players will have that expectation. And I think that that's the most important thing for me. And that's why that's why I am pleased about Matt is that, that that's the way in which he will He'll, he'll walk this from day one as though this is what we're about. And already, you know, we were lucky. To, I was lucky to be at a media day and talking to the players. There was an astonishing focus on the idea of this is all about promotion. Promotion is everything. Promotion is all. Nothing else matters. And I think that if they can do that and keep that at their core, then from there, it is an exciting appointment. Um, I think that there was, there was ways Liverpool could have gone that would be more experimental and riskier. I think that's fair to say. There was stuff that they could have done that would have been a little bit different and might have made you go, oh, okay, that's innovative, or that's that's come from left field. What they've actually done is, I think, just gone and got the best manager they possibly could at the time uh, and the most proven manager and the safest pair of hands they could have got and the manager who will view himself as I manage WSL football clubs and will see himself as being on a journey to getting Liverpool not just back into the WSL, but then into all, up towards the top six of the WSL, and that's where he'll see himself. So I think that all of that matters and they will be the expectations and for me that's the most important thing Liverpool's not an art project it's not a laugh you know this should be the idea that there's a duty around this there's a responsibility and the responsibility is grabbing Liverpool and making them back into a WSL team just in time uh, around all of this extra exposure and the funding and the money that comes with it you know this is Liverpool can't do another they've got to do this season in the WSL they can't do a third one they cannot be coming also, Ran. Uh, it is from Sunday, from day one. There's loads of reasons why I want Liverpool supporters uh, to pay attention to and go to Liverpool women's games. But the main reason why I want them to is that it is now or never uh, to an extent. This is a massive season for Liverpool women and they've got to start well on Sunday. Matt's integral to that, but so are these players. And it's it's significant uh, that they start fast and that they do not do not allow opportunities to any rival. So, totally agree, totally agree, because that's, like, for those who don't know, there is an extra exposure now to the women's game on, there's going to be live games on BBC, there's going to be live games on BT, so... Yeah, Everton are, time... Ever, Ever are going to be on BBC One on a Saturday afternoon when there's international men's football on and no no uh, f- top flight or even second tier men's football on, and Everton are on BBC One, and if that doesn't sicken you to your core, I then I think, you, I think you're doing this wrong. Yeah, that game is also at Goodison Park and it's against Manchester City. So yeah. that in itself, you know, it's yeah. a massive game. Yeah. It's By a massive way, game and fair play to the Blues. Go on, Emma. I was just going to say, can we get Neil and the dog out on Sunday? Because that team's all <laughs> <laughs> Just get them to, to watch this. We'll be yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but to be fair, the frustration for women's football fans has always been there's not, not enough people know about it. There's not enough shouting about it. This yeah. is your opportunity to shout about it. But if you're Liverpool, you're right. You're, you're right. Chris. Yeah, exactly. You're right, Chris. Out. Yeah, exactly. You're right, Chris. And 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 you know, in general, I'm, I am pleased. You know, uh, uh, Philippa goes with her husband Neil, to, and she watches the Everton games. And I think that that's a good thing. And I think that in general, part of what Liverpool football clubs' focus should be, or anyone who runs a major. Uh, sport and franchise within women's sport should be is to get greater exposure towards women's sports. So don't get me wrong, I'm not sort of up the wall about that. But if there isn't somewhere in most Liverpool supporters something that sticks in their craw that Everton get attention and we don't, then frankly we're doing it all wrong. <laughs> this stuff is about rivalry and it is meant to be elite sport. And what Manchester City do last season, Manchester City put che- push Chelsea to the title. Chelsea make the Women's Champions League final. That is elite sport. And I want Liverpool at the centre of elite sport, um, you know, elite football in this world, literally the whole world, the whole globe. I want Liverpool to be front and centre of it. I don't want Everton to be front and centre of it. Or if they are, it's because they're playing us. This stuff isn't complicated. <laughs> and I think that it, you know, and I think that that's got to be the attitude. The attitude should be from a Liverpool point of view. And by that, I don't just mean the club and I don't just mean the players and I don't just mean the manager. I mean the supporters as well. We should be demanding excellence. We should be saying we want to be the best amongst this. And as I say, we, we're now we're now a bit of a way off that. But we can demonstrate it early this season 
And I'd love a situation, for instance, where Liverpool start the season so strongly in the Women's Championship that they're able to focus a little bit on the FA Cup in the second half of the season, that they're able to grab that attention, they're able to want and get a cup run where it doesn't take away from the focus on the league because the league is already, you know, it's going so well. They're able to say, how deep can we go into this other competition? I think that that's, I think all of that matters and it matters this season more than ever because it is on BBC One, it is on Sky and it is being billed as elite sport. So that's what we're about. Kind of knows that. So after that rallying cry, uh, let, let's do a new f- feature we're going to have on the show, which is going to be we're going to do a bit of a player focus where each week I'm going to bring up three players from the w- women's squad to introduce you to who they are, what they're like, you know, and what you should sort of look out for when, when you come and watch uh, the women play. Now, let's see if I can get this screen share to work. There we go. So first one, first one after Neil's rallying call there is Nifahi, who is who took over as Liverpool captain uh, last last summer. Um, she, how, she's been in the club now for three three seasons now. She's a very heavily decorated player. Uh, she's won three WSLs with um, Arsenal. Um, she's got 94 caps for Ireland. You know, she can play centre-back. She played DM. She is what you want, as in my head, as a Liverpool captain. She's a great leader on and off the pitch. Um, I've had the pleasure of speaking to her. I think Philip and Yumi both had the pleasure of speaking to her at Liverpool women's supporters meeting um you know she she's just great isn't she yeah absolutely i mean she's she's the steady idea that you want in the side for me um you know she's the real leader in the side um she leads by example as well you know she's she's available you know pretty much every single game um and she she just she's the talker there for me at the back um she's the one that organizes us um and i feel like you know, although she's she's probably you know one of the players that's at the latter end of her career, you, you, you don't ever see that from her. Um, you know, she like you say, she can play in defensive midfield as well, and um, she did that towards the end of last season. And I thought that actually she had some of her best games at, cent- at defensive midfield as well. Um, I expect her to start at the centre back uh, this season, but it's going to be interesting because there's plenty of um, competition for her now as well. So whether or not that also helps her to to raise her game as well. Um, but yeah, she's uh, she's a, a strong international player, um, and yeah, she's been with the club for like three years. So she's been been with us through all the the lows of the the last few seasons, um, and I'm sure that she she's ready to see a few highs and. And hopefully that's what we get this season. Yeah, and she's a, uh, and she's self-confessed. She's a massive red. You know, all, all her brothers yeah. are big Liverpool fans. So you know, it, it you could tell with, with her, it, it does mean more. It does hurt more when it's it's your team, if you know what I mean. Um, so moving on to our second player, which um, is, I think is probably Emma's favourite player, but I think it's also Neil's favourite player because uh, when Rachel heads a ball it stays hit. I'm telling you I've never seen anyone head a ball like she can. <laughs> um, so she is possibly one of the best January signs I've seen Liverpool do because um, we were struggling obviously in WSL and I must admit that was the ray of hope that came, that, that came when Rachel came. She's just goals, experience and she drags players up to the required level. If you're not at the required level she will tell you and she will show you how to get there. She's just inspirational i mean no wonder she was made vice captain and she's got 61 caps for northern ireland i think the only sad thing for her was unfortunately she um she broke her uh broke a leg as uh, in the so she missed the, the second qualifier so but she's brilliant absolutely brilliant isn't she emma yeah uh she's amazing as i, as I said <laughs> yeah, I, I i absolutely love her i think she's brilliant um, she's a great character as well. Um, she's very vocal. Um, you know, we just spoke about Neve being vocal on the pitch, but um, if if you ever go and watch watch the women, then the one voice you can hear is this, this big Geordie voice of uh, of Rachel Furness on the pe- on the pitch. So um, yeah, she's got real presence. She's a real leader. But yeah, she's she's a kind of player for me who who absolutely wears a heart on her sleeve. Plays with a lot of emotion. She's spoken. In the past, I think she's done. She's done a video on on uh, Liverpool Football Club this week about her passion for her granddad and how sort of you know he got her into into football and she plays for him every time she gets on the pitch and she's a very very emotional player and she she plays for the badge. So if you want to go and watch somebody who knows what it means to represent a club like Liverpool Football Club, then uh, Rachel Furness is absolutely that player. 
she'll do everything for the team. And to be honest, that's that's all I want in a player because I think if you're playing for for my football club and you're you're essentially living my dream, then uh, then I want to see that passion. So uh, yeah, I love that. It really rubs off on me. Um, but in terms of obviously the, the the player herself, quite clearly she is one of our standout players. Her goal scoring record, like you said, when she came in in January, I think she actually finished the season as, as the highest scorer in the league. Rinzola, I think, was the top scorer overall. But I think uh, Rin's got scored a four in one game, maybe in a cup game. But Furness actually scored um, more in the league. I think in that sort of five month window, and bearing in mind COVID stopped the stopped the uh, the season short as well. Um, and I do strongly believe that Liverpool would have stayed in in the WSL um, off the back of largely like Furness's form going into those those last. I think we had five five six games left. Um, but yeah, she's 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 been phenomenal since signing. Um, and like I say, uh, I think I'd love to see her and Nat Phillips have a game of heads and V's because I just think they would be absolutely <laughs> unstoppable. Uh, Nat's yeah, got you, you, yeah, you I don't think... want to get in the way of one of her headers, that's for sure. No, I think I think even Matt Michael, that's Nat Michael, that's too much for me though. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. And um, the final player uh, is what we've already mentioned is um, Ash Hodson. So Ash has been. Done all the career level, she came through the uh, development side. Um, you know, she's a fantastic winger, she's a uh, very funny. Uh, following my conversation with uh Kerry Holland, she is also described as the Joker in the pack. Uh, I think if you see any of the social media, you'll you'll get that. She's uh, a very fun person, but a very, very good winger. And to be fair, someone who's also come back from a lot of adversity, I think she's had two ACL injuries. I mean, that having one's bad coming back from two, and to be fair, she's come back from two. I don't know if she's lost a yard of pace. She's so direct and she's got she has got that X factor of a goal for a goal in her. Um I, I think she's great. I think she's great. Um Neil, what do you think of what do you make of Ash? I think she needs to add some goals, and I think that's the case with a few of them uh, who mm. fall into this category. To be honest with you, I, I think she seems. You know, you, you mentioned there about the the, the fact that there's, there's a really strong character there, and I think there's a number of Liverpool players, and it feels as though it could well prove to be a really strong dressing room. But I think if you if you're looking at Ash, you're looking at Mel Lawley, you're even looking at Yana Daniels over the course of a career. If these players are going to play in the most attacking line, Liverpool need to see them stick the ball in the back of the net a little bit more. Uh, that's not to say they've got to go from the current goal uh, output and suddenly start hitting 13s, 14s over the course of the season. But I think there's key moments, and I think those footballers would say that themselves, to be honest. But this is back to my so the wider point of letting footballers relax a little bit. There was a game, the last game of the season, last season, Mel Lawley misses a, a really good chance, and Liverpool have two or three really good chances in the last sort of six, seven minutes of the game. But everyone's snatching at it because the game's level. The game hasn't been put away. No one's relaxing. No one's able to get into a groove of goal scoring. And for too long, and I'd say, you know, you look back on the numbers of it, it's three seasons. This is a Liverpool side where no one's been able to find the way in a relaxed way playing a competitive match towards becoming a goal scorer. Everything's been pressure. The scoreboard pressure has been a constant for this Liverpool team for too long. And I think that players who would otherwise, you know, playing in different sides where scoreboard pressure was less of a thing, thinking about Ash, thinking about Mel Lawley, uh, thinking about a couple of others in there, they would have found it easier to score some goals uh, over the course of campaigns because the idea that everything that you do matters so much uh, would have would have dissipated because you are taking games away from teams and that's you know that is the most important thing and that is the drum you know that can be consistently sort of banged all the way through I think it, the same thing you can have a conversation about Rinsola in a sense you know Rinsola I think felt as though she had to be at the fulcrum of everything all the time because every match she was playing in was a close game no matter how many chances Liverpool created it remained a close game and that's for me that's the most important thing and that's the thing that needs to change because if it does if liverpool do start taking games away from teams before you know where you are ash hodson mel lawley the score in the third or fourth in a 4-0 win and then suddenly the week that follows the score in the second in a 2-0 win or a 3-0 win and then the week that follows after that it's easier to score the opener because guess what you've just scored two in the previous two weeks games you, you you're in a goal scoring groove and for these players, I think it is important and it's, it's the, the idea of what this team needs to do as a collective is take the pressure off itself a little bit. And the best way for it to do that is to take those chances, but to grow week by week by week. And I've got loads of faith that for the talent that, you know, I've mentioned Ash there, but also Mel uh, that they've got and Yana, 
the talent that they've got, the thing they need to do is be in a side that they're able to demonstrate that talent and not fret over everything that happens all the time. And for me, there's a season that Ash, Ash Hodson will have at some point in her career where it will all click and the circumstances will be right and all of a sudden she'll look like the footballer that she can be. And, and if we're fortunate, that'll be this season and it can act as a springboard from there for seasons to come. But sometimes what happens to all footballers, all levels, men's and women's, is that you bogged down by what's going on around you. And if there's one thing that Matt Beard can bring, I think it's being able to free some of these women up to be able to be the best versions of themselves. And if he does that, then I think that Liverpool will will find a way through, not just on Sunday, but but week in, week out. I think getting these footballers liberated a little bit, I think will make a world of difference. And I think that Amber Whiteley started that work a little bit last season, towards the end of the season, when there was less pressure game by game because Leicester had won the league at that stage, if we're all honest. You know, Liverpool begin to find the back of the net more often and hopefully they can get into that groove again this season and then from there they can play some good stuff. Awesome, awesome. So, speaking, speaking of scoring goals, let's talk about the game this weekend. So, um, this Sunday, it's... Uh, look, uh, London City Lionesses at two o'clock, Prenton Park. Um, you can still get tickets. Um, you know, all you have to do is get on the website and get, get them. Uh, it's two two o'clock kickoff. But um, Philippa, what's going on uh, pre-game? Because there's quite stuff, quite a lot of stuff being organised pre-game as well, isn't there? Yeah. So um, I mean, obviously they've they've put on a, a trial this time as well for a free coach from from Anfield as well to hopefully make it a little bit easier for people to get to Prenton Park. Uh, but then once you're there, um, I think activities start about half past 12, <coughs> the meal. Um, mm, yeah. So there's, I know the Anfield Rap are going to be there doing doing a few bits. Um, there's a marquee on. Uh, they're going to have face there's, painting. Yeah, there's going to be loads of activities for, for younger people uh, and all of that sort of stuff, uh, uh, which is, you know, great. I think it's really important people can bring families down. When we say we're doing a few bits, you know, we'll chat to people and if there's anything around and, you know, if there's a couple of maybe players who aren't selected or are injured or something, if there's an opportunity to, to do a bit of talking with them, we will. But I think what matters more than anything is that people who have not been to a women's match before, whether as individuals or as a collective, it's more the idea that everybody needs to make everybody else feel welcome. Um, yeah. In every opportunity, so whether that's the, the sort of the family fan park, there's a really good pub. Well, I mean, I say really good. Let's not overstate it, but it will make it really good on the Sunday called the Clipper. <laughs> that's just by the ground, and you know, I think it's, I think it's what matters. I think is that people shouldn't feel like they haven't got the knowledge base. They shouldn't feel as though you know they're going to get there and they're not going to know anyone, or they shouldn't feel as though they're going to feel a little bit left out. I think if we all accept that we're all on the start of a journey here, first and foremost, then you know, it's it's good. And I think that it's not about, as I say, Emma will be there with a bit of luck. Philippa, you know, you'll be around. Me and yeah. John will be around from the Anfield Rap. Harriet's coming. But it isn't about, it's about sort of people find just finding their friends. And by that, I actually mean new friends, new people. And that, that to me, that's the most important thing. You know, you'll be there, Chris, as well. And yeah, yeah. I think it's, I think, I think, you know, saying to people, everyone's welcome to this. And as I say, if you wouldn't recognize any of the players out of a lineup, that's fine. But come and do three games and you'll recognize them all. And for me, that's the most important thing. And I think that we can have that across the board. And so, you know, whatever's going on, whatever else is happening, come down, enjoy, relax, get into watching a really good game of football. It isn't about, you know, it isn't about anything else. It's about the idea of, of as I say, meeting people and starting something and starting something from the ground level. Because this is the point about this. You know, they're not playing WSL football. They're, they're playing in the championship. But if they get promoted, and we all hope they will and they should, then we're all there next year and we've all got one year behind us and then we're there the year after and we've got two years behind us. This is an opportunity to be in at the ground floor of a big adventure, an adventure that I hope ends with Liverpool at some point. If it takes 10 years, five years, nine years, 14 years, let's all be in at the start of an adventure that ends with Liverpool winning the Champions League. Awesome. Sounds great. Yeah, yeah I mean, look, <laughs> I can only echo what Neil said. I, mean, I started going five years ago with my daughter. I I'll be fair, I couldn't tell you any of the players' names, who they were. And after two or three games, uh, you get to know people who go regularly. Um, I mean, I bumped into Philippa when we started going to Prenton Park. Uh, we And that's how you... But then you start to know people and sort of go, oh, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. And you can sort of build up then. And, you know, I've I've got friends now who literally I only know through women's football. And that's how it works. And then you, you have the collective view then of, let's go and, let's go and get the Reds to get, to get a win. So... Philippa, we win it. We win it. Yeah, definitely. Um, start well, 
get a few goals in the bag, um, get the confidence going, and uh, hopefully with the fans behind us making a making a racket, we'll uh, we'll get the, the team over the line come the end of the season. Let's hope so. Let's hope so because um, you know we've and also we can. I think we've got Amy Rogers coming back, so like you said, ho- hopefully it doesn't come to haunt us. Um, but you know, yeah, she she was a great servant for Liverpool as well. So you know, I'm sure she'll get a, a very good welcome from the crowd. Uh, well, until kick off anyway. Yeah, it's a bit, different, <laughs> bit, bit different than when to kick off. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, it's all, all gloves are off then. So that's all cool. Uh, one last thing before uh, we end the show is uh, we mentioned this in every LC Day Tripper show. So if you've heard it before, I don't care. You're going to hear it again until until <laughs> it happens. Um, Sienna Steps. So you've seen the hashtag Sienna Steps. We've been talking about it enough times now. She has the opportunity. Uh, to go to America for treatment for a form of uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, there is an opportunity for it to go in November now. So, But our target is we need to raise £120,000. We're about halfway. So whatever you can do, if you go onto any of our Twitter feeds, you can find the GoFundMe page. Please give to that. Uh, we are trying to virtually fill Anfield. It costs you one euro for a, for, a, for a virtual ticket. This doesn't get you into Anfield. Please don't get excited. But, you know, <laughs> we're doing everything we can to try and get this, get this young girl the treatment to, to just basically make her life a bit easier make it normal you know her, her mum would dream is when she starts her first day of school she can walk in like all the other kids that's literally what it's all about so you know if you get if you can do that and if you can't give to it just reshare it just get as many people as we can around it so we can try and help that but what i'd like to say is uh for the first show philippa Emma, Neil, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is the LSE Day Trippers. We will be doing another show, show of these. The aim is we're going to do one a month. So hopefully at the end of September, we'll do another one where we're talking about Liverpool with three wins out of three and we're on, on, the, on the march to winning the league. Mm-hmm.